So uh, thanks, thanks everybody for coming. Uh, so I just want to talk about a bunch of stuff that I have uh, observed over the past 10, 15 years that I've been in the US, uh, like pursuing my own academic career and doing a job there. Um, so like Slo said, uh, I'm currently working at Google. Um, and uh, I really like the company actually. Uh, it's, got a, it's got a lot of smart and motivated people. Um, like they want to change the world. You know, that's what they constantly think about. It's a very transparent culture. Like it's none of the whole, uh, we won't tell my, our employees what's going on. They, they're very transparent about the whole process. Like the management, uh, they don't force people to, you know, like the underlings to work, uh, uh, like, you know, like in, in projects that they don't want to work in. They, like, uh, the, the employees have a lot of freedom in that aspect. And also, like, you get lots of uh, products like free food and uh, lots of cotton <laughs> chips. <laughs> it's always a fun thing. Uh, so I never cook at home, actually. Um, and the employees are generally very, very happy. Um, why? Because they're basically doing things that, uh, that they love doing, computer science, and they're changing the world by their own. So, um, so most of the presentation, by the way, is just going to be a very, uh, it's, it's very general. So if you have uh, specific questions, you feel free to like uh, use your content and just ask. Uh, you don't have to wait till the end. Okay. So, uh, so the question is, how do you get into such tech companies, right? So, so there's Google, Facebook, uh, Microsoft, all these Amazon and all these companies. The question that a lot of people ask is, how do you get into these companies? Well, like any other job, there's only two uh, two things, you know. First, you have to be invited for the interview. And then you have to do well in the interview. It's <laughs> pretty uh, straightforward. So the question now is, how do you get invited to the interview, right? So uh, for most of these tech companies, uh, this works really, really well. So you have to get a referral. So basically, you know somebody who works in the company, and that person says, oh, so and so, I know so and so. Uh, can you interview him? That's, I mean, I'm pretty sure it works the way, the same uh, way in, in Nepal, right? <laughs> and uh, it's like that over there, but obviously they interview them and they do a through all the quality control processes to make sure that they are good candidates. Uh, if you don't have people that you know in those companies, then you can go to a good university. And the cool thing about uh, going to a good university is all these companies, they come to the universities to recruit students. So like Google, Microsoft, Facebook, and Amazon, they all come to Georgia Tech, where I went, and they say, hey guys, please come to work for our company. They come to the university to recruit, uh, recruit you. So that's why you would probably want to like apply to go to a good university because you get access to all these companies that you might want to work in. Not only in computer science but any other major, including the finances or accounting or whatever. Um, and also, uh, if you, for some reason, don't have a referral or you weren't fortunate enough to go to a good university, then you got to get noticed somehow, right? And if you have done tons and tons of projects, if your resume has lots and lots of projects about interesting projects about research and open source stuff and independent projects, then that's always a great way to get noticed. So all three things work, referrals work probably work the best because you know like they just send you, they just give you the referral and boom, within a few weeks you are invited for the interview. Um, so so the question now is after you've been invited, how do you do well in these interviews, right? So again, so I'm mostly focused on tech uh, uh, tech companies, uh, that's my background in computer science. So, um, so basically, you have to show that you have a good, uh, solid understanding of computer science. So what does that mean? Uh, it means that if you guys are like familiar with computer science, then you got to know your data structures, right? Hash tables, uh, you know, stacks, all these things, link trace, and, and all these things. And you got to basically know like data structures and algorithms. So breadth first all these things. These are, if you look at any curriculum in the US, uh, these are things that they teach you in your first or second year. And these are sort of the foundations from which computer science is built on. You know, like they, they teach you advanced things, but it's all built on these data structures and algorithms. And if you know those things pretty well, chances are that you will do pretty well. So that's only one part of the equation. So if you have a good solid understanding of computer science, that's the first step. The second step is you've got to practice uh, all these technical interview questions like crazy. And uh, the cool part about it is um, they have, there's so many resources uh, online on the internet. Like careercup.com is one of those uh, resources that's very helpful. They list all these questions that come in these uh, technical interviews. So if you're a computer science person and you want to work in, say, Silicon Valley, uh, not just Google, but any of the Silicon Valley companies, there's so many companies in Silicon Valley, right? Then most of them do a very similar style of interviewing. You know, they have these technical interviews where questions are very similar to questions that uh, they uh, had in career It's going to be very similar, not exactly the same, but similar. Or you can read books, you can get the book however you want, but you can get uh, Cracking the coding interview, or 
or there's other books that uh, talk about how to do well in these technical interviews, so you can just uh, go through this box. And if you give yourself about three to four months of preparation time, and maybe every day, about an hour, you just go through those books and then practice whiteboard, right? Like you go write, uh, like you read a question and then maybe you have a friend there sitting right next to you, maybe both of you are doing uh, the, uh, the practices, so you can, he can pretend to be the interviewer while you like explain the solution to him and then change goals. So you can do those kind of practices. And if you do that for three to four months, I can tell you that you'll, you will not want to do this uh, interviewing uh, system. You know? So I think that's one of those things that a lot of people don't do. Like they have a good solid understanding of computer science, but they don't practice technical interview questions as much as they should be doing, and that's why they sort of don't do well. You know? And the last part I think is pretty fairly obvious. You have to be able to articulate your thoughts. Like during the interviews, um, like at Google, what they do is they first give you a phone interview, which is 45 minutes long. And then if you if you do well in that, they invite you on site, which is then you go to their headquarters, right? Or wherever the nearest uh, campus is. And then they'll basically they put you through like four interviews, which are 45 minutes each. And these are gonna be like four engineers who are pretty good. And they're gonna, and the engineers are randomly assigned, they're not gonna be your friends, right? And they just come and they ask you lots and lots of fundamental uh, computer science questions. And, um, and yeah, you have to be able to articulate thoughts because if you aren't able to communicate uh, your thoughts, like what you're thinking right now to them, like they won't know what you're thinking, like oh, it's pretty obvious. So you have to be able to, able to articulate your thoughts. Uh, so it's just practice, you know? like if you practice this part for three to four months, then you'll be pretty fine. And like I said, there's so many companies in, uh, in Silicon Valley, some of the school, and these are like the, I guess the ones that are, are pretty popular, but there's tons of these companies. So, like, given this knowledge, hopefully, if you are going for an undergraduate uh, education in the US, in the four years, you can, you can always start early, in the second or third year. And these are gonna be a similar thing for, for internships too, by the way. So this is mostly, I was talking about full-time uh, jobs. But if you want to do internships, it's going to be a very similar experience too. It's going to be less interviews, but very similar. So in summary, go to a good university, maybe a master's degree or an undergrad degree. Uh, meet lots of good people so that they will refer you, right? They will graduate, they will go work at that company, and they will say, oh, I know this guy or this girl, and can you like, ref can you interview him or her? Or you can all, and, and if you go to a good university or any, any decent university, you get a good class of computer science, and. Uh, you can do a lot of projects while you're there. So, um, so that's pretty much it for, for Google. Uh, if you have questions, like I said, feel free to ask. Okay. Or we can wait till the end. Um, so now on to my, uh, my academic journey. So like uh, like Chulof said, uh, I uh, did my PhD in computer science from Georgia Tech. Uh, and my specialization is in computer graphics, actually. So what exactly is computer graphics? I'm pretty sure you guys know that, right? computer games and whatnot. Um, and why did I even come across this field? So what happened was, when I was an undergrad in Georgia Tech, I took this class from this professor, a very interesting guy, and uh, computer graphics class, and I just fell in love with it. I said, wow, this is so fun. Because you do programming, you do math, uh, you do visualization, you do lots of algorithms. It's an ideal blend of all computer science uh, topics and, and beyond do math. Do that. So it was just a natural fit, so I worked with him, and then in the end, I ended up doing a PhD with him. So. So it's sort of like it started when I was an undergrad working with him. Um, my dissertation topic, just to put it out there, is called Compact Connectivity Representation for Triangle Meshes. Uh, it's, it's, some, it's an algorithmic dissertation. It, it talks about data structures for triangle meshes. If you guys are interested, you can check it out. It's on my website. If you want to <laughs> burden yourself with it. To 200 pages of uh, <laughs> dissertation. You can just look at the pictures. Um, so now the question is, uh, I did this PhD thing and, and I want to like sort of talk about why even think about doing a PhD. So right now maybe you guys are in high school or maybe doing an undergrad, but it's never too early to like start thinking about these things. If you plan ahead, of, like ahead, it's always best. So one of the first misconceptions that everybody keeps on telling me when I talk to them about doing a PhD is they say, oh, you have to be super, super smart to do a PhD. And that's, oh, let me do some. So that's one of those uh, misconceptions that's just blatantly false. You, know? you don't need to be super, super smart. What you need to be is interested, you have to be motivated, and you have to be willing to work hard. But you have to be, I mean, decently smart. You can't be like, uh, what is computer science, right? But if you are decently smart, if you are 
like going along fine in computer science uh, degree, you, it's fine. You don't need to be super duper smart. You don't need to be Einstein smart. Either. This is one of those misconceptions that a lot of people have, so I want to make sure that you guys understand that. You don't have to be super smart to do your PhD. You just have to be willing to work hard and be interested in that area, that topic. Um, so besides that misconception, uh, this is my biased opinion, I think it's a lot of fun. Um, like I said, uh, you get to solve problems that have never been solved before. So essentially, like, there's human knowledge and you get to add a little bit to it, a small delta. Um, but collectively, as all humans, we increase it. Right? So that's, I think, a pretty fun part, like, you get to solve problems that have never ever been solved before. And it's very challenging at times, you you're like, oh, what's going on? But Overall, in the five, period, five years that you spent there, it's a wonderful experience. Uh, and also, you get to work with uh, world-class researchers. Um, like the academic community, like if you join computer science, for example, computer graphics, the academic uh, community is fairly small. Um, I mean, there's going to be a few hundred people, researchers, who are uh, the, the world-leading experts. And you get to like work with one of them, and then you sort of slowly get to work all of them. So you basically get to work with them, which means uh, it's going to be pretty helpful to you, right, in your own academic journey. And uh, because you've been, you'll be able to uh, solve problems that have never been solved before, you can make an impact. That's pretty obvious. And uh, I think this is sort of overlooked, but uh, you get to become a better problem solver. So if you have been able to solve a problem that nobody has ever solved before, you can bet that you can solve any problem in the future. Like, it's, uh, it's going to be much easier. And during the PhD process, they will teach you how to go about solving problems. It's not just you have to be you have to have an idea. It's not. It's, there's a process there. They'll teach you the process. And the last thing that maybe some of you are aware of, or maybe a lot of you aren't aware of, is that these students. It's not like regular university. It's actually like a scholarship position. So they waive tuition. You don't have to pay any tuition. You take classes and everything. The tuition is free, and you get monthly stipends. So annual salary goes to twenty thousand and above. So if you're in California and all, it'll probably be 30,000. If you're in New York, it'll be 30,000. But if you're in like states that aren't that big, it's going to be 20,000. So it's a pretty good salary. It's decent to uh, you live on. You can even send some money back home if you want to do that. So, um, so yeah, I think uh, PhDs are pretty fun. So the question now is, how, how do you get into a PhD program, right? Um, so, it's actually very similar to the undergraduate experience or the master's experience, and I'm pretty sure Sulov and all the other advisors have, here have talked to you about the process. The only difference is going to be research portfolio, um, and that's sort of it. You know? So let me talk about research portfolio. Okay? So let's say you want to apply for a PhD program, and uh, you have done an undergraduate or master's here or in the US, anywhere, right? So during your undergraduate or master's, you go work with some professors, and maybe they'll pay you, they sometimes pay you too. Or you can work for free, you can volunteer with them, and you can do some interesting research with them. And that itself, every work that you do over that two or three year period, it adds up. So it looks like, you, you're basically gonna say, I did so and so research with so and so, and this is what I did, and this is what I accomplished. I even published a report or a paper. And all these things add up. So when, when, when you apply for a PhD application, that's what they are looking for. They're basically looking for people who are driven and motivated. And obviously, if you do all this research during your undergrad and all, you're driven, right? You're motivated. And if you work with uh, some of these professors and you do well, they'll obviously write uh, letters of recommendation for you. And they'll write really good letters of recommendation. And this is one of those things that can, that's sort of like, it's a, it can be a done deal. Like, if you get a wonderful letter of recommendation from a good professor, it's as good as you're into any program that you want. So I can tell you one story. Um, so I worked with uh, one undergrad uh, back uh, in Georgia Tech. And um, so I, I used to mentor undergrads like crazy along, like uh, back at Georgia Tech. And I would mentor them starting from freshman all the way to uh, their senior year. And he, he transferred actually. And he was there starting his sophomore or uh, junior year, or second or third year. And during the time, I encouraged him to do research and whatnot. So he did all those things. And by senior year, uh, he had a pretty good research portfolio. He had worked with two or three really good professors. And uh, the professors loved him. Um, he was a very hardworking guy, very motivated guy. And for him, the application was pretty much uh, the professor picking up the phone and saying, yes, he's good, that's it. And then he got into a choice school that, he, that everybody desires in computer science. 
So, um, letters of recommendation are extremely important uh, in, in the PhD world. Uh, statement of purpose, I think it comes naturally, it's, a, it's the essay part, right? So if you have a research portfolio and if you work with professors and you are doing something in, in some research domain, uh, a statement of purpose naturally comes. But you can always talk about how you plan to, I don't know, help Nepal or something, right? Um, so yeah, statement of purpose, it can be a very ambitious plan that's extremely uh, going into 10, 20 years in the future. Um, and they love those kind of things. And you can relate uh, exactly your, uh, your research to. And the other things are also important, but not that important, by the way. So grades are okay important. Uh, GRE, if these are like sanity checks, you know, like you make sure that this student uh, has done a computer science degree, you know. Um, but you don't need to get, in the GPA scale, you don't need to get a 4.0. You can get a 3.2 and still be fine. <coughs> Um, GRE2, it's basically uh, a similar story there. Uh, you want, they want to know that you can, uh, you can read English and you can think about it. Um, but yeah, like the most uh, area of emphasis, I mean, these are definitely important, but not that important. What I'm saying is, relatively speaking, like this is the most important thing, then this, then this, and this. It's an order from this. So, um, so that's yeah, pretty much how PhD applications go. So if you have questions, let me know. Um, yeah. Now the uh, PhD qualification exam. So do we have to keep the PhD qualification exam? If I find the PhD, have to do a master's here. Yeah. So um, PhD. So the question is, do you have to give a PhD qualifying exam after you do a master's here and then you join the program there, right? Yes, you do. So normally every school, university has a different uh, framework that they've set up. So you have to do like you have to have completed these milestones, and PhD qualify is one of those first milestones. So what normally happens is if you've done a master's here, you're going to go there, and then you're a PhD student there, and then they're going to say, okay, uh, you have to take a few more courses because these are additional courses that are required by our curriculum, and you say, okay, let's, let me take those courses. And while you're taking those courses, you do a little bit more research with your professor, and after about a year or so, maybe a year and a half, they have this qualifying exam. And it depends on the department. Like my department, what they did was, what they required was, you have to have done a published worthy piece of research, which I had, and then you have to take this exam, an all day exam, which is open book, open internet, you know, and um, yeah, you basically give the exam, it's an eight hour exam, and then you're done. And then they will look at the, the questions and answers, and then and then you have to present your research to, to them. That's sort of it. And there are other schools within, there are other departments within our university that had a different approach. What they would do is, uh, they wouldn't really have you, uh, they wouldn't really require you to research. They would just require you to take a written exam. So, so the question is yes, you have to take a, quali uh, a PhD qualified exam, uh, but it depends on, uh, uh, like, it might vary you know, from school to school, university to university, department to department. So, it looks like you've already sort of looked into this uh, domain. Cool. What's your major? So, um, yeah, that should be good. So, um, so the next step is, uh, so the PhD thing, hopefully that's covered. Maybe you guys are thinking, maybe it's possible, right? But let's keep it in the back of your mind. If, when you join a, an undergraduate program or a master's program, or if you're already doing a master's here and join a PhD program there, think, think about these steps and say, it's possible. And like I said, you don't have to be super duper smart. You just have to be motivated. So the next step, I think, uh, is a master's. So again, this is another thing that I just wanted to uh, share with you guys, just so that you guys know uh, how it goes. Um, so for master's too, just like PhDs, they have stipends. And um, I think uh, even people who come to Georgia Tech, sometimes they want to know about it. So I just wanted to let you guys know. Maybe some of you guys know, maybe you don't. But for your master's, you can get graduate research assistance, which means you get a tuition waive and you get money, uh, you get paid money to study, right? Isn't that a great deal? So, um, so but the thing is, uh, like when you apply for a master's and you seek a graduate research assistance, it might be a little tough, like they normally prefer PhD students, uh, they normally prefer giving it to PhD students. But what you can do is, after you've gotten a uh, master's, uh, like after you've gotten accepted to a master's program, which is normally one and a half, two years, right? 
then you can go there, uh, I would just say like a few months before the semester starts, and do your homework, like figure out which of the professors are doing what research in that particular uh, major that you're interested in. They'll usually be, if you go to a good university, there'll be three or four professors, and maybe even more, that are working in an area of expertise or domain that you're interested in. And then just look at their, everybody has a website, look at the projects that they're doing right now, look at how much funding they have. So this is a, one of those interesting things that a lot of people don't know. So see if they have funded projects. So NSF is basically the National Science Foundation. And what happens is a professor, when they want to do research, they have to get money to do research, right? So they need to um, sort of like subsidize that. Well, they need to pay themselves a salary and also support a student. And so what they do is they get money from this entity called NSF. But there are other entities too, like NIS and all this thing. But NSF is just one of those. And they get money, and then uh, they do their research, and then they produce something, right? They say, here's a list of results that uh, we've gotten out of uh, our research. So, and the cool thing is, uh, NSF, they publish, uh, they publish a list of all the funded researchers. So you say, okay, I'm going to go to so-and-so university. I know five professors that are there. Just put in their name in that system, and you will see like what kind of projects they are currently being funded uh, with. And then see if that's a match for you. And uh, we'll try to do it for two or three universities so we have plenty of professors to look at. But yeah, so I'm, what I'm trying to say is um, if you go early enough and you talk to a couple of professors and you know which professors to talk with and then you figure out what projects they're working on and you know that they have funding for these projects, then you can actually volunteer your time for a little bit. You show them your commitment and then show that maybe, maybe the research requires a computer science person you go and help them with your computer science thing, and they say, oh, this person so and so is pretty decent. Um, I can I can keep him as a graduate research assistant, and they'll wave a tuition and, uh, and they'll give you a monthly stipend. Too. That's a great way to uh, get a master's degree. So, uh, so after that, uh, it's a very similar thing for master's application. Again, uh, it's the same thing. Down there, there is a recommendation stated made of purpose and grades and, and whatnot here. But this is sort of, I guess, a little bit of a difference from the other uh, part. Uh, I think if you have re done research, it's helpful. Uh, but I don't think that's necessary per se. But if you have done a lot of pro uh, projects, that's very wonderful. So when you apply to a master's program, you say, hey, look, I love computer science, and here's the reason why I, uh, you know, why I claim that I uh, like computer science, and here's all the projects that I've done. Yeah, the university is like that. Because it's not only you that's investing in the university, it's the university that's investing in you too, right? It's a two-way process. Right? Like, does that make sense, right? So the university wants to hire good people, sorry, wants to take in good people, so that when after they graduate, they do really good work, and then the university says, that's my graduate, right? So what, what, what they want to do is they want to get good people who are highly motivated and whatnot. So it's both 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 ways. So yeah, just do a lot of projects, uh, do research, work with NGOs. Um, it's a lot of fun, right? Uh, do lots of open source projects if you are a computer science person. Do your own in independent projects. Uh, that's always helpful. So it's a lot of initiative. But all these things go a long ways, and that can help you formulate a good statement of purpose too. Because you can say, look, I've worked in this, this, and this. Uh, maybe I've worked in child education and all. And that's why me going and doing education for I think, like something, women's studies or something. It's very ideal because I've done a lot of work in that uh, domain, right? So, so if you have projects to back up what you're saying in a statement of purpose, that's wonderful. And that's what the university is want. So the next question now is I've been saying do projects, do projects, do projects, right? So why even do projects? Uh, well, uh, I think it's a lot of fun. So <laughs> like the PhD, it's fun, you know, like, so you, you like doing something, right? You like computer science, let's say. What better way to learn than to do some project in computer science and potentially use it to help something, somebody, right? Um, when I say projects, I don't mean uh, course projects, by the way. I don't mean, uh, oh, yeah, my teacher assigned this course project to me. That's not a project in my definition. A project can be something like I pursued it during my own free time, the week evenings, weekends, vacation time. I did it during my senior design project. I chose it. I said, I'm going to do this. And this is going to help me. Uh, I like doing this. Uh, you know, all these things, you know, all the positive things. And that's what I call a project. And like I said, universities and companies too. So when you apply for work, 
The companies love people that run a lot of projects. Like, imagine a resume that has GPA and I guess that's it. But it, it wouldn't look, it would look very uh, unappealing. It would say, oh, he, all he wants to do is just go to class and then come back, that's it, you know? But like companies and universities, they want to motivate people, right? They want to say, what else do you do? And that's where you say, oh, yeah, I, during my evenings and weekends, I volunteer somewhere here, I, I help out here, I've led this initiative, I organize this event. I've also done lots of projects uh, in uh, computer science, I've uh, contributed to open source, all these things. These all add up uh, to making a wonderful application for work or for university. Uh, and the last thing is uh, undergraduate applications, uh, which I think uh, you guys know a lot about. Uh, but here again, it's the same thing. Show some leadership, volunteer, help out, organize events. These look, these are wonderful ways to give back to the community, and universities love that too. And you can have fun too, like you are making an impact in the community, right? And also do projects, right? Work with nonprofits. Uh, if you like computer science, do a computer science project. Um, but these, I think, are very important uh, in making an application really, really good. I mean, you can have letters of recommendation. Well, if you do these things, letters of recommendations come automatically, right? Maybe you are volunteering uh, with some nonprofit, you work with them, you do a wonderful job, and the nonprofit guy, person says, so and so is an extremely enthusiastic, enthusiastic individual, very motivated, and I see a bright future for this person. Please take him, right? That's a, that's a wonderful pitch for you. So, do um, lots of projects, uh, letter of recommendations come automatically from there. Uh, and then, statement of purpose of the essay also comes from there. Yeah, like I said, if you've been helping tutor children somewhere, and, or, I don't know, help underprivileged people somewhere, uh, and maybe use computer science to help in that process. And if you want to pursue uh, an undergraduate degree in computer science with, uh, I don't know, uh, to target the developing world, they have this kind of measures then it's a natural fit. You can just say, look, I've done these things, and this is what I want to do, and universities love that. Uh, and, and of course, you got to get your grades and, and all, but like I said, grades are uh, not that important. Um, SATs are uh, there, too. These are all sending checks. Um, uh, so a whole slide for this, uh, by the way. Um, grades are not that important. Um, so so Google has uh, actually uh, said this openly, uh, like if you look up grades aren't important uh, on New York Times. So uh, the, the head uh, HR person, I think, uh, said, hey, uh, what we have noticed in our, when we hire people at Google is that there is no like strong correlation. Like if you have a wonderful focus in the GPA, it doesn't mean that you're going to do wonderful work. You know? uh, but instead, what they look at is, uh, have you done projects and whatnot, are you engaged? Uh, Actively doing other things, not only grades. Grades are only one indicator of who you are. Right? Um, so why I say grades aren't important uh, is also another. Re there's another reason. So it's uh, and this idea of opportunity cost. So if you do economics and all these things, very important concept. So the most valuable thing that you have right now is time, uh, and of course your motivation and all those things. But time is it's very precious, you know. And you want to utilize that fairly. And if you want to get Great grades, you're going to have to invest a lot more time than if you want to get decent grades, good grades. Obviously, don't be failing, that's terrible. <laughs> but uh, what I'm saying is, you don't need to get, you don't need to be the, the class proper. You can be in the 25% or 15 or whatever. A little high up there, but don't invest so much time into doing nothing but studying like crazy that you miss out on all these other things, you know, putting on projects. So every hour that you save yourself from having to study so that you don't get 100 in mathematics, you can invest in doing a project um, which universities love. So it's this idea of opportunity cost, right? Like the same time you can allocate to doing wonderfully to get a good grade or you can do a project. Right? And uh, that's pretty much it. So two final thoughts, uh, two slides, uh, final thoughts. Uh, I think this is fairly obvious to everybody. Uh, you can do all the projects you want, but if you don't like doing it, then it's pointless, right? <laughs> So you gotta find something that you like. Um, like for me, I, I knew I liked computer science when I was in high school. So it was very clear to me what I wanted to do uh, in my life. I didn't, when I was starting out in high school, I wasn't thinking of doing a PhD. But uh, I, I at least knew that during my undergrad, I wanted to do computer science and I wanted to make wonderful things and help the world using computer science. So 
Um, so the question is, just because you like something, does that make it your uh, make that your proposal? Like it depends. So what did you have in mind? So um, so so it, it's a, it's, a, it's a tricky question, right? So so the way the world works is um, so you want to make an impact, right? You want to do something that you love doing, and while you're doing all these things, you want to have a nice life too, right? And um, and right now the world says, oh, computer science. Uh, you like computer science? That's great. We're gonna, um, you know, like make you reasonably happy. We're gonna give you a decent salary. But somebody says, oh, I love skateboarding. And the world says, well, there's only 10 or 20 professional skateboarders, and they make a good living. But the rest of you guys, the economy doesn't support that, right? So, so it's a tricky question when you say just because you like doing something, does it? Make that your proposal? Does that make it your proposal of life? Um, I don't know. I don't. I don't think so. I would say you should uh, like make an do an analysis. What I would recommend is, for example, if I love, for example, okay, so here's my story. I love guitars. Right? So when I was in high school, I was a guitar fanatic. I would wake up, play guitars, <coughs> evening sleep, guitars every day. When I'm eating food, I'm playing guitars. I was crazy about it. There's something in the brain that said you should play guitar and nothing else. So I like doing it. I like computers too, but I like guitar a lot more. So for some time, I contemplated, hey, should I stick around? Maybe improve myself a lot more. I've already been playing for a long time uh, by that time. Yeah. So I say, should I become a musician? Musician because it sounds so promising, right? And I could be a rock star, and you know, like who doesn't want to be a rock star? Um, but I did an analysis. So luckily, I like computer science. I like guitars too. And I said, guitars can be a wonderful hobby. I can always do it on the side. And I can compose music, I can do this, I can do that. All these things can be done on the side. But computers are very promising for many other reasons. I like computers more. You know? and, um, and the potential impact is much higher, right? Like with computers, you can change the world. With guitars, you can, uh, but it's music, right? So when you say, if you like something, can you make that a purpose life? Use your own judgment, right? Uh, do analysis. What I normally do is pros and cons. Should I pursue this? Yes, no, make a list of things. And make an good analysis, spend two months uh, figuring out what exactly this means versus the other. And yeah, choose wisely. But it's important, right? If you are doing something that you don't like doing, life's gonna suck, you know? <laughs> like, do you want to do something that you don't like doing? Uh, I don't know. Maybe some people do that. But <laughs> But uh, yeah, spend some time trying to figure out what you like doing. Uh, but if you don't know what you like doing in high school, that's fine. Just just pick something up, keep on doing that, and sooner or later during your undergraduate, you'll figure something out. Uh, if during that time you can't figure it out, maybe do a master's. Hopefully at some point in time you'll figure it out, but not too late. Um, so yeah, do something that you like doing. Um, the other thing is, uh, I think this is extremely critical and important. This is. Uh, well, you can't understand the importance of this thing. Time management is important. Um, so what does it even mean, time management? Right? I think it's fairly known. Uh, but if you guys want to figure out techniques on how to uh, do better time management, read up a lot of articles on how to, how to do time management. There's plenty of articles there. Uh, usually what happens is every person has their own uh, style. So what works for you might not work for the other person. So. I tried out, I mean, when I was trying to figure out some good strategy, I tried out maybe a lot of strategies over a period of maybe a year before I settled on some, uh, some things. And at the end of the day, it's usually very simple things. But yeah, read up uh, on time management or how to do time management pretty well. Uh, this, I think, is very obvious too. You need to be able to set goals. You can say, I want to do a PhD right now when you're not again in high school. And uh, if you work towards that goal, it'll take you five, six years, but it's possible. Uh, but if you just set goals and don't do any planning, that's only half the picture, right? So you gotta do set some goals, do some planning, and then manage your time well, and you know, the sky's the limit for you. Um, I think this is also fairly important. If you wanna, if you like computers, you gotta find like-minded friends. You gotta find friends who like computers too. If you are the only person that likes computer science and everybody likes uh, nothing else, but like something else then uh, it's going to be difficult for you. Right? You can not talk to people, share ideas, motivate each other, help each other out. So that's, I think, a fairly obvious point, too. 
So if you like computer science, like the major, or mathematics, economics, any of these majors, then do that. Um, you can find them in your own school or outside of school. Like for example, if you're a computer science person, then find friends in the open source community. It's a great group of friends. Uh, then work with them and support each other, create all these things. And last thing uh, is um, this idea of doing projects and how you can do uh, lots of projects that are fun for you and you know. So when the time comes for you to apply for jobs at universities, they say you've done a lot of projects. We like you. We want you. So I'll take you in for uh, our program. So if you uh, okay, so plan to do projects every six months. Okay, so one project for six months. Okay, I mean, you don't have to stick to it. But I'm just giving you like one planning strategy. Plan to do one project every six months. So that means if you want to get into a PhD program. That's an undergraduate degree and a master's degree, three to four years and one to two years, that's uh, four to six years, which is eight to 12 chunks of six months each, right? That's a huge amount of time. That's 10 possible projects by the time you're ready to apply. Well, maybe nine because last semester it doesn't count. Right? So, like, sort of, sort of like think of it this way, right? Like, don't be saying, oh, I'm going to do lots of projects, uh, you know, and that's going to be six months later, six years later. No, be thinking about every six months I'm going to do something or the other and work slowly towards that goal. Likewise, for masters, if you want to join a master's program in the US, and if you're doing a three or four year or even five year undergrad here, same thing here, six to eight or ten jumps, right? And same thing, uh, if you want to do, join a good undergraduate program, then year of high school, 19, 11, 12. Hopefully, you start in 19. <laughs> but three to four years of high school, that's six to eight jumps. And eight possible projects. That's a whole lot of projects. So, yeah. Well, that's pretty much it for, for, for today. Um, if you guys have, so this was uh, intentionally very generic, uh, very uh, generic, but if you have lots of, lots of questions about, more personal questions about my own academic career, my own uh, uh, career life, then feel free to ask that. Uh, did, you, did you do your undergraduate in college at that yeah, so I I stuck, I am one of those rare cases where I stuck at the same university for a long time. I call it the cubed degree. People call that the cubed degree. You get an undergrad, master's, and PhD in the same degree. Three degrees from the same university. And there's some people who do a postdoc in the same university, so that's the four degree. And then they become faculty, that's fine. <laughs> so, yeah, you could do that. I know one, one guy who did four, you know. He, was, he went to MIT. Undergrad, masters, PhD, postdoc, but then he went to a different university and became a professor. But uh, yeah, he did four things. Yeah, question related to the question. So the question is: uh, Is a postdoc necessary to apply for faculty positions in the U.S. Right? Yeah. So it depends. Um, so so some of my peers they were pretty good. And they were much better than me. And um, they had a lot of publications in very reputed, uh, much more than me. And uh, they were very highly attractive candidates for faculty directly right out of uh, the PhD. So for those guys, uh, you don't have to do a postdoc. Because what faculty, as faculty, what they, well, sorry, the university, what they want is they want to get a young person who can do research and you can change the world by like, through research. And if you have shown that, during your PhD, you can necessarily go become faculty. But that's not usually the case. Uh, it's a little harder to make a huge impact. You have to be, you have to have the right problem. There's lots of things that will fall into place for you that will happen during your PhD. So normally, a lot of people do postdocs after the PhD to uh, get a faculty position somewhere. And the postdocs can go anywhere from two to three years or even more. So it depends on, uh, yeah, on, on how the PhD went. Good question. Looks like you've done more. <laughs> and more questions? More questions about Google? Appreciate the question. I only did one slide about Google. I was like fast. Uh, you know. What do you do before? So I work, uh, I work uh, in this product called Image Search. So I'm what they call a ranking engineer. That, that means that I have to uh, write algorithms to make uh, image results better. So I am basically a guy who sorts things. I just write a better sorting routine. That's, that's 
So I pretty much know what what uh, what is available online. So the idea there is you're gonna put uh, balloons and you're gonna put it around uh, Mother Earth. And it's gonna be strategically placed uh, all over the world. But right now it's in uh, it's in development. So what they're doing is right now they're sort of like going around one particular latitude, which is sort of in the south, uh, goes to Chile, New Zealand, and any other countries. Yeah, I think I thought it was three countries. But anyways. Because are somewhere around the south uh, that here, it just floats around and then yeah, it gives internet. But the goal there is to provide internet uh, for the whole world. So that's something that I uh, like about Google. So a lot of the times their uh, their intent is to provide things for free, to provide access to uh, technology to the whole world. So that's how uh, most of the company uh, thinks, which I think is pretty nice. Okay, uh, it's just a basic three G is free, right? Three G is three G is free. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I mean, if you raise that interest, sorry, is that three C is free more, or or something more also? I think uh, what happens is uh, so there's these balloons that go up, and then there are receivers. Volunteers put receivers uh, in their homes, and that home has access to maybe there's a certain radius, right? We are all restricted by the laws of physics, right? So there's a radius there, and then whoever is in that zone can get access to internet when the balloons are around there. And the overall, for well, the long term, super long term goal is to have balloon strategy placed all across the world, like up there and there. No, it won't block the sun, right? But it's like tiny balloons, right? But they have a radius of uh, coverage. You want to cover the entire world. Um, that's the long term plan. Right now, it's an experimental phase, so it's sort of like going around the latitude. You know? But then soon it'll be like all the world. Once I learn about Google Smell, what is it? Google what? Smell. Google Smell? Yeah. Uh, so, so Google's a very fun company. They uh, they do a lot of jokes, practical jokes. That's one of those April Fool jokes, I think. <laughs> <laughs> is it true that Google uh, lets its employee to spend a portion of its time in its own function like this? Work. Yeah, so that's uh, that's true and sort of not true. So here's the thing. So 20% means basically you have five. So in the US we work five days a week. Here we work six hours, six days, right? which is a lot. But uh, five days a week you work there, and uh, one day out of the week, 20% of your time, you are free to pursue a project in computer science. You don't, you don't just go play. <laughs> But you basically work on something outside of your main core assigned work. So you can start a new project, do something interesting, something fun that can help the world. But yeah, it is a true state. Yeah. Uh, you work at Google Office or you work online at Google? No, I, uh, I work in Mountain View actually. So I flew in all the way from California. I'm here for a week. So I work uh, at the office. So I don't know what the question was. So the question was, do you work at home or do you work at the office, right? Uh, I mean, like, I work at Google office. Like, sometimes, yeah, I do, like, Google sites, like, uh, at home, you can work for Google for $5, you can increase this So I thought, like, you work for Google, uh, office, uh, Google office, like, So, wait, I don't, I didn't get the whole question. <laughs> so, you work, you work at Google office or you work at home? I mean, like, Right? And you work uh, directly by going to the office, uh, or you like home or you manage everything. No, I go to the office. So you're probably asking, can you telecommute, right? Can you work remotely? Yeah. Um, so within within uh, the company, uh, a lot of people, uh, the option is there, but a lot of people prefer coming uh, to the office. And here's the reason. So you work with maybe uh, maybe five or six or maybe ten other people. And you want to stay connected with them, you want to share ideas, you want to share thoughts, you know, all these things. You want to stay connected with them, you want to collaborate with them, work together with them. So telecommuting, uh, if you do it like every day, you know, like you want, you will lose the connection. But, um, but that option exists. If you are sick, you can work from home. Or if you have, if you have something to do at home, like maybe, uh, uh, I don't know, if you have toilet broke or something, 
and the uh, plumber took some time to come and they can only come at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. They can stay at home and be working while the plumber comes. So that flexibility is there. I think what he's saying is like something you might have seen here with been on the online and then you take ads and you get money. Oh. Right? And most of the people think that when you say like you work for Google and people think like that. Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> How does Google make money? So Google uh, makes money through a couple of uh, ways. Uh, you can read up articles online, by the way. But here's, uh, I think, a couple of uh, ways Google makes money. So one, the biggest one is advertisements, ads, right? So let's say uh, you want to buy uh, a camera, right? And you say buy camera in Google. And uh, they'll show some relevant ads, maybe from some local company that wants to sell that camera to you at a good price. And you say, oh yeah, that looks like a good ad. You click on that, and then you go there, and then you buy uh, a camera. So these ads that uh, Google shows, and the ones that are clicked, uh, that's where the money uh, is being made. So each advertiser that they uh, pay money for these clicks. That's one way. Uh, there's YouTube ads. YouTube is also part of Google. I appreciate you guys doing that. Uh, there's Android in the Play Store. Android is also part of the Google ecosystem. So uh, the Play Store, there's money made uh, because people buy apps, right? So you can. What kind of computer science degree or projects we have to do to invest so that big mobile companies can have? So the question is, what kind of computer science projects do you have to do so that big mobile companies can hire you? So I've never worked in the mobile uh, space, uh, but um, I have to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> but so, so usually, like, uh, so, so you say, okay, I want to work in the mobile space, right? So here's what I would do if I were you. Right? So I'd be like thinking, oh, I would like to work in the mobile space. Let me figure out what kind of technologies mobile space uh, companies use, what kind of projects are they currently doing, and make a list of projects, like read a lot of articles. I would spend like two weeks, three weeks just studying, doing nothing but reading of lots and lots of articles on what mobile companies are, the technologies they're using, the projects they're working on, their future projects that they're working on. And after I've figured out a bunch of things that they are working on, then I would prioritize it and then say, okay, these three technologies seem to be the most occurring technology that everybody uh, needs to use. And I focus my energy in learning those technologies and also focus my energy on doing projects that these companies are currently doing or are planning to do in the future and maybe collect one project that's going to go for six months and then do that for six months and then go on to the next one. So, so I don't know if I answered your question, but you know, that's what I would do. Uh, but I'm not like exactly sure what they what they would be missing. But certainly like knowing about how to program in Android and iPhone, iOS, they would be useful. Yeah. Google is Google Chrome Ah, okay. So your question is, oh, so Google seems to be a pretty successful company. How is it that they're doing it? Okay. So um, I think uh, that's a really, really great question. So um, so I've sort of thought about it. I've read, read about it too. So the thing is uh, something uh, that I mentioned in the first slide. So one is they tend to hire people who are very motivated. Uh, what does that mean? That means that when you are hired, there's only maybe five other people you're working with. They are all. They all want to build things. They all want to do things, right? So it's going to be a good environment for you to work in. Like when you're working, and they also want to build things and do new things and whatnot. It's exciting uh, environment. Versus if they don't hire motivated people, and there are five people that you're working with, and three of them are like, yeah, whatever. I'm just here to make my money, you know. Uh, and you say, oh, how about doing this? And it's like, sure, go away. I just want to do what I've been assigned. It's not a fun company, right? the employee morale goes down. So that's one part, so they hire, they tend to hire lots of smart and motivated people. Um, the second part is, um, like you said, the management structure. So what I've noticed is, uh, usually there's managers who manage a couple of people, a couple of employees, maybe eight people. And the managers, the way they manage them is, they give them a lot of freedom. They say, they don't force you to do things. So you say, they say, hey, do this, and if you don't do this, you are gone or something. So that certainly makes it much more, uh, uh, you're, you're, you're free to pursue what you want to do, right? 
but obviously it has to be within the project framework, right? You have to work on what the team is supposed to be working. You can't be doing some random thing, you know. Maybe you can do that random thing in the 20% time. But you have to do something within that thing. But manager will say maybe here are three or four projects that, that you could work on and you say this one seems like the most impactful or the most interesting to me. So you can work on that. Um, besides that, I think perks are always helpful, right? All this free food thing, I think it makes people and I think it's a nice thing, you know. Um, the other reason why free food is nice is not because it's free, but because again you're working with five people and your company gives you food and it's delicious food, it's good food, it's like very, very good food. So what you do is you go with your five teammates and you go eat together with them. So you are constantly eating together with them, so you're not just working with them, you're friends with them, right? Because you, you eat together, you do things together. So I think that structure is also there. So people are, are more, uh, you know, that, that lunch part, doing lunch together, dinner together really helps. Uh, besides that, there's a culture of transparency. Uh, to a certain extent, Google uh, is very transparent within the company. They will tell the employees what's going on from all the way up. They won't hide things from the employees. And um, there's a thing called TGIF, which is a Thursday event where employees come just like this, and then the employees can say, I have a complaint directly to the owners. So the two owners, they come, and then they are sitting there listening, and the employees come and they directly ask them, well, why isn't this going the way this is supposed to be? Or, well, you can always say, well, great work, also, but you know, if you want to complain, you can do that. And so I think all these things sort of make up a, a fairly happy company. Um, yeah, people are fairly happy. Um, because the employees are happy, I think the company just succeeds. Uh, Oh, our, our managers, employees too? Um, and former employees. Oh. Yes, yeah, so, so the question is like, are managers, I guess, get promoted and become managers? Yeah, so there are engineers, right? And then there are managers to engineers, and there are directors that manage managers, and there's other people up there, right? So uh, there is a hierarchy there, but the managers are normally uh, what what Google prefers is normally they prefer uh, people who are engineers. So you are an engineer, let's say I'm an engineer. I work together with six people, and I've been working in the team for uh, maybe two, three years. And then they'll promote me to a manager, and they'll make me what they call a tech lead and a manager. A tech lead is like the lead for the engineering project, and also I'll be managing people. Too. So they do that a lot of times. So the managers are, are very, uh, they know about computer science. Google is a very big company. So over the years, Google has produced a, a different variety of products. So uh, in your opinion, uh, uh, during these periods, how the ideas are really conceptualized? And uh, isn't, uh, does these ideas are from the low level or the ideas are from the top level management? And then these ideas are actually implemented uh, through the virtual net networking or something really uh, to a, a proper process of organizational way of doing things. Yeah, so the question is, well, Google's a big company and how do they select the next projects to work on, them, the next big area domain, right? So they certainly started doing Android, which Google wasn't doing. Google is a search engine, right? I used to be. And they do Android develop, or they develop Android, or rather they bought Android and then they continue to grow it, right? So the question is, how do they decide to enter a particular uh, area, right? Um, I don't think that's going to be too bottom up. Uh, it's probably going to be a top down approach. So you have a lot of people who are motivated, who know what they're doing. Uh, there's 45,000 employees, and out of them, there's a few key leaders who know what they want to do, right? So I think it's mostly going to be the normal process, the top down. If you want to enter this huge market that nobody's ever done. But, um, but I think the bottom up uh, thing exists too. So I can tell you, so Google has done this thing called Course Builder. I don't know if you're familiar with it. So you guys know Udacity and Coursera. Um, wonderful things Google did up. Uh, Coursera, Udacity. 
these are Coursera and Udacity is basically they're providing university level education for free. So they have Stanford professors give uh, an entire class on machine learning. I don't know if you guys are familiar with machine learning, but it's a computer science topic. And uh, these guys will give the entire class for free. So it's a pretty cool thing. So if you want to go to the US, that's certainly one thing you can do. Just study up on a couple of courses so you know what's going on. Um, but in that similar, uh, so what I was trying to say was they did all these things and Google hadn't done anything in the education space. So they built a product called Force Builder that is uh, basically designed to help uh, anybody, it's basically open source uh, project, help anybody create a course and put it uh, uh, online. It's sort of like what UDST and Coursera are doing. And that was, I think, a fairly bottom-up, uh, might have been a bottom-up uh, project. So I think there are going to be a combination, but I think most of the time it's going to be coming from the top. But that part I'm not that familiar with. So read a lot on, on how they do it, because I'm pretty sure there's lots of articles that have explained how that happens. Does uh, Google collaborate with other companies like Facebook? Interactions like Do they collaborate with other, other companies? I think so, yeah. But but I can't I don't uh, I don't I can't think of any off the top of my head. But I think uh, that exists, that happens. But that's a good question to Yeah. Thank you. 
We don't want to put them. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Lenny Pace and Sergey, right? Right? That's, you Google that, right? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like, uh, whenever we are working close, uh, we ask them, with our friends, they recommend like just Google it. <laughs> then, uh, then how how does Google accumulate such uh, big data, such big info? Is there any process for accumulation? Yeah. So the question is, um, you go Google things, uh, and then things just come up. How does it even work? Right? How does this whole idea of web surfing things work? So, so first of all, I would recommend you take this course called uh, Intro to Computer Science something. But in that, from Udacity. There they'll teach you how to build a web search engine. I mean it won't be as good as Google, but it'll be you'll have you'll have you'll get all the ideas. So what what it, what happens is for search engines, first of all, um, you basically do this process of crawling. You start from a web page and then you have links, you follow the links, you go to the next page, you go to the next page, right? They have links, you go to the next page, and then you collect all these web pages that exist in the web. And then you do some algorithms to it. And then you have all these web pages saved in your database, so go as a big giant database. And then all this uh, information, when somebody searches for information, you basically yeah, go look, look up that information, it's like a database. Right? And then whenever you get a hit, you will surface that information. Then you sort of like sort it in terms of relevance or usefulness, and then you show the results. So that's sort of the, the high level picture of how web search engines work. Um, the exact uh, details, if you want to know more about it, I would recommend you take the Udacity course. They have, they'll teach you, I believe it's in Python, how to how to build a web search engine in Python. And it's a introduction to computer science uh, class. It's a great way to teach uh, computer science. But yeah. Google is a big company. Everyone It has brands in all over the country, like Nepal, India, other countries. So uh, the question is, uh, does Google have a lot of branches all across the world? Um, yes, uh, they have uh, lots of branches in the U.S. They have some offices in India too. Is it Bangalore only? I have Bangalore and Kurgaon. Okay, so there's three offices. Oh, by the way, so Nepal doesn't have an office, but Nepal has one employee. <laughs> That's him right there. That's uh, Saroj Gagabai. And um, if you have more questions about Google, you can ask him to afterwards. But yeah, Nepal unfortunately doesn't have an office, um, but we have uh, one employee who's working uh, for Google to help, uh, help uh, make things happen. We have office in Russia, Europe, UK, Ireland, uh, South America, Japan, Taiwan, Hong Kong, China. Yeah. Which programming language do you use? Uh, for my work, so the question is, what programming language do I use? So, um, so, so I'll give you the, the straightforward answer and sort of a different answer. So, uh, so the first answer is it doesn't matter. <laughs> but anyways, that's not the, that's not helpful. Right? So uh, the the language that I use is C plus uh, plus. Most of the time I use C plus plus in my work. I use Python too sometimes. Uh, I don't use Java that often. Uh, but the reason why I say it doesn't matter is uh, if you are if you know one particular language and all the programming languages are very similar to each other. They have a loop, a for loop. They have if conditions, right? They have functions. They have classes or objects or some ideas. So they have events. You know? So all these constructs that uh, make up a language are very fundamental things. So it doesn't really matter what language you use. But I do use C++ a lot. Like uh, your partners, other influence, they use different it depends on the product. So most of the stuff that uh, our teams they use C++ um, because it uh, they, yeah they sell several things about C++. But there's uh, other teams that use Java. Um, those are probably the two big uh, languages that I use. Uh, Java and C++. Maybe Who decides to which language to use? Who decides what language to use? Um, so so usually all the projects uh, if the project has already existed uh, in the past then they have a code base that already exist. So if the language they're using to build is Java, then you'll probably stick with that. Um, if you're starting a new project, which I haven't done, I'm pretty sure there's going to be an analysis phase where you say what are the pros and cons of using one language versus the other, and you stick with that. Do you need to be specialized in just a single language, or you can have background, like background knowledge? 
uh, yeah so I think just learning one language is, is more than sufficient uh, more than learning the language you've got to know the fundamentals right because a for loop is a for loop in any language uh, if condition is a if condition in any language unless if it's some weird language right? like R or J <laughs> so yeah as long as you know the fundamentals uh, fundamental constructs of a language uh, you should be fine in the technical interviews What motivates you at Google? Is it a brand name associated with it or something else? So the question is what motivates me at Google, me personally, right? So um, there's many things that uh, motivates me. So one is I love computer science. So that I think is an automatic uh, motivator. I, I would be happy working in any computer science uh, company. The other thing is, um, well, that's not true actually. Uh, <laughs> I'd, be, I'd be much more, I'm much more happy working here than the reason why I much more happier I'm working, uh, working here is I really like the philosophy that Google pursues. Um, they provide a lot of free services, uh, so anybody with with access to the internet but no money can use it, right? You can use Google Docs for free, right? Uh, unless you're using it, but uh, you can use it uh, for free, and I mean that's wonderful, right? You don't have to pay. Well, maybe in Nepal it's different, but uh, for Microsoft Office, right? You can. You know, so I think these ideas and also like the friends and co-workers are all motivated and hardworking. So I think these sort of add up. And I think it's a cool company, too. it's fun. I've, I've loved the company for a long time, so I don't know. Like, so with respect to my question, uh, are there any other uh, companies uh, associates you are attracted to in the future you want to work with? Um, is there any other company that I would like to work for? Uh, I don't think so. I don't think they like right now in this uh, in this particular year. Maybe in the future, see, but at this year, I think this is the best company to work for. But I'm biased. Okay? Um, yeah, I don't think I would work at any other company. Yeah. I've been using Google for many years, let's say uh, six, seven years. But for even the small things, I use Google. I feel like that I know many things about Google. But the paradox is, I don't know what is the meaning of the term. Oh, so it's actually a misspelling. Uh, it's um, it's uh, 10 to the power 100. Um, it's a huge number. So if you go to Wikipedia, I think they have a story on how the, the name came about and all. Uh, they have that in there. So um, I believe what happened was they wanted something interesting and fun for the name. And it's actually a misspelling. It's uh, supposed to be G O O G O L, I think, which is 10 to the power 100. And uh, and one of the guys who registered the domain name mispronounced it because Google and G O G O L and G O G I D sound similar, and he registered G O G I D and it's just how it is. So that word itself uh, didn't used to mean anything before it now means web search, search right? But uh, it, it, it was supposed to be G O G O L, which is a huge number. Ten to the hundred. Yeah. Besides of the projects on the very beginning, can you uh, mention some notable projects you have worked on or you are working in? Oh, can you say that again? Like, uh, what, are, what are the projects you did uh, during your master's or PhD okay. or are currently working in? So you said, okay, so I said do lots of projects, do lots of projects, right? <laughs> <laughs> and then and then uh, I never said, well, what did I do, right? So that's a good question. So what kind of projects did I do during my undergrad and master's? So that's a, I think a really good question. So during my undergrad, um, I used to do a bunch of projects. <laughs> <laughs> so there were a lot of, uh, so what happens is in US universities, you're allowed to work, right? And um, for pay, and uh, I think 20 hours per week. And I joined, I joined Georgia Tech, and there was a particular uh, position that I really liked. It was a student assistant position, student assistant position, where you had to basically code stuff in C++. And we were basically building um, Palm OS. This was a long time ago, by the way. Palm OS was very famous back then. Now it doesn't even exist, but you know. Uh, so we were coding uh, applications in Palm OS as an undergrad. So I went and applied for the job. I said, this is really cool. I would like to do that. And also get paid right, while doing that. So that was one project that I did. And uh, I did that for one and a half years, maybe even more. 
So that's one project I did. Uh, most of the other projects I did were research projects, actually. So once I, uh, after I discovered this wonderful uh, uh, world of computer graphics, I said hey, to the professor, can I work with you? And he said, yeah, sure. So I said, can you give me some research project to work on? And he said, yeah, here's a problem. So I did a project with him. It was some uh, 3D stuff. You know? um, there was another time, too, during summer where I was working with uh, uh, another uh, professor who was doing uh, brain research. Um, so this was a very interesting project. What they were trying to do was they were trying to control uh, devices using the brain, right? So you can imagine a person who's paralyzed. The only thing they can do is they can blink their eye and uh, sort of think, you know, think thoughts. So what they were trying to do was control. It was a research project, so it, it is very far away from being practical. Like right? that's how the research projects are normally. But uh, the goal that they had was: can we control this robotic hand to um, hold something? You know? And uh, I worked on that project. It was a pretty fun project. Uh, so the idea was basically controlling the brain, there was a signal, and you would go up, uh, up and down. Based on that, I would uh, move the robotic arm, so you have to position the joints, right? So a robotic arm, that three arms. You know? So yeah, so this one's two on right? So three arms, and then you would control the, the degree and rotation and all to reach a particular location so that you can do things. So that was a pretty fun project. Um, so I think those were the three uh, big stuff that I did during my undergrad. Uh, the thing that I did on the side in addition to these things was I did this thing called programming competitions. So I don't know if you guys are familiar with programming competitions. So uh, during uh, undergraduate, um, these are like basically the Olympics of the Olympics for computer science. So I used to do a lot of that, and this this was a lot of algorithms and all, and. It was a good group, cool group, core group of people. I used to work with a lot of people and like talk about different ideas, how to uh, code different kinds of algorithms and all. And that thing I did for many years actually. The entire time I was there at Georgia Tech uh, during my undergrad. So that, that I think was uh, the big uh, sort of the volunteer project sort of on the side that I did. So yeah, those were sort of the things I did. For all these things, what I noticed is that uh, there was a professor or there was somebody who had a, an interesting project, and they said, you know how to do computer science, you know how to program, you know how to do algorithms, can you help us? And I would say, yes, sure, I can do it. So that's sort of normally how it works uh, with undergraduate uh, students. You go talk to professors, and then they'll give you interesting projects to work on. You can do your own project too, but uh, yeah, I think working with the professors, they'll give you nicer, interesting reasons to Progress. Good question. So, uh, it's, it's image search, it's a software engineer. So, so it's image search, right? So the product is basically trying to give you results for images. So if you go to images.google.com, you search for images, it searches for images. So the question is, how do you um, sort the results in a nice manner? That's a big algorithmic challenge. So basically, the role of, uh, of my team's role is basically to rank them or sort them. So it's basically sorting. of starting a search engine company in Nepal? So I don't know. So the question would be, uh, what is the goal of a search engine company, right? Well, the goal of the search engine company is to surface relevant results and give it to the users, right? So you say, oh, you're searching for something? Oh, here, this is relevant to you. I can show it to you. And I think Google does a pretty good job of that already. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah, so um, I think you could try it. That, that's definitely going to be an interesting problem to work on. Um, but the world of computer science has so many interesting problems. You know? There's like thousands of problems to be solved. Uh, 
But such and such companies are, I think, a good idea. <laughs> What is your weekly salary? <laughs> <laughs> what is my weekly salary? I, I can't do the math. <laughs> but, uh, but they pay you well. So if you go to Silicon Valley, um, they, they say, oh, you're, you're decent, we'll pay you a salary. So if you do an undergraduate and go to companies in Silicon Valley, you'll probably get upwards of 8,000, more than 8,000 dollars per year. Um, if you are um, it's sort of average. You can always get less or more, but more than that normally. Um, if you have any other higher degree or if you go to a decent company, they'll pay you more than hundred thousand dollars per year. So it's it's good salary. <laughs> <laughs> So I don't, know the, I don't know the details. The question is, there's lots of hackers who hack systems. How do Google deal with it? I don't know the details, but I know there's a security team that works uh, to actively um, control that. So it's like any other company, you have problems, you fix it by having some employees work on it. But it's uh, the security team that does that. Right? So if you, like information security, that's what you would be doing. You would be working on this kind of issue. search engine work, right? So like I said, a web search engine works by crawling, right? It goes to a web page and then it goes to a web page and links. So if some web page is not part of this crawling process, then it's not discovered, right? So so if there's any web page that's out there, then I'm pretty sure there's going to be quite a few. And if you search for that particular thing, you won't find it. So it has to be indexed in the, in the big giant database. Decided you were computer science after high school. Mm -hmm. What did you actually do after getting into Google or getting into Google? What was actually? Um, actually, uh, as a high schooler, I was very naive. So I wasn't thinking about working at big fancy companies. All I knew was I like computers, and I said if I go to a nice university in the U.S then I can learn computers some more and I can have more fun. And that's all I was thinking. Um, I guess I sort of knew in the back of my mind that after graduation, you know, if you do well and if you have fun, you will, uh, you know, companies will hire you. But I hadn't thought of it that way. My goal was to, to explore this space. I liked it and I was going to just, you know, like have fun doing it. But, uh, yeah, like I said, I was a little naive when I was young. So maybe now I would probably have said, yes, my goal would have been to work at that company. And here's how I'm going to do it. And now, is there any thoughts that are in higher than you do? For me? Yes, there, there is. I mean, I think uh, as individuals, uh, at least now a more mature individual, that is me now, I have goals. I have mostly thinking about what next, uh, next five years, ten years, uh, two years, one year. So, yeah, I constantly think about that. Um, yeah, goal setting, right? you got to set goals. Um, and if you work towards it, if you plan, yeah, it's achievable. Do you have time for one or two more questions? One or two more questions. Okay. What kind of engineering can you do on top of the other way? On some of the science or economic or other things that you can get up and over into the world? So, how, how can an engineer yeah. do up and over into the I mean, how can an engineer get promoted uh, at Google? I think, I think you've got to have a, a good grasp of computer science. That's, that's, I guess, the first important thing, right? And anything else that helps you um, become a better problem solver, can help you work together with people, other people, can help you lead other people, 
these are all important qualities. So, so if, for example, you study philosophy in computer science, and have to, having done philosophy, you know how to, I don't know, communicate better than other people, that's always going to be helpful. So they normally tend to promote people and put people who, uh, put people in position who are to, uh, to lead projects. They put people who are, uh, who have shown that they can lead uh, more than um, me, uh, I mean, I used to like economics. Uh, uh, I've taken classes in economics, but does it directly help uh, in moving up uh, the promotion thing? I don't know. I would say it would probably be a small, uh, there would be a small correlation from the line. So probably, uh, I would say like the fundamental skills would be be good in computer science, to know how to work with people, know how to lead people, know how to solve problems, know how to come up with ideas and propose ideas, know how to project into the future. And if you have this kind of skills which can be developed by studying computer science and any other thing, like you could be reading your own books, um, that would be helpful to you. But you don't need to get a dual degree. Oh. Uh, I heard about Google Maths and Google Card, yeah. and they have some unique features. And um, are those some other applicable jokes of Google that those features are actually Oh, so you're saying uh, there's Google Glass and there's self-driving cars. Is it already a reality or is it just in the future? It's actually a reality. So Google Glass is supposed to come out next year. Uh, self-driving cars. OK, so let me explain what Google Glass is and self-driving cars are. So Google self-driving car is you drive a car. A human drives a car, what they are saying is a machine, a computer program can drive a car. So it's a self-driving car. Um, why even do that? Well, it's a fun computer science problem. Uh, but also, uh, a lot of people have to waste time uh, driving uh, in the US. So you might live one hour away from your work. So every day you drive to work for one hour, you're stuck in traffic jams, you know, like in Taekwondo. And then you do your work, and then in the evening you go back again, waste one hour driving. So lots of wasted uh, time, right? So what they said was, can we um, can we do this whole process automatically? So that's one. The other thing is safety too. So you might be like drinking and driving, right? <laughs> and that's not a safe position to be in. You might go crash into somebody and it's not really safe, right? But if automatic uh, self-driving cars are safe, then you can just have, you know, you can be drinking like crazy and still know that you'll be fine. And you won't go hurt somebody else. So. And also, like the technology was possible now, so they did it. So now they've already driven um, a self-driving car 300,000 miles, which is nearly 500,000 kilometers on the road on the streets. They've driven it 500,000 kilometers already. Not with a single accident. Huh? Not with a single accident. Or with one small minor accident, but it was uh, the other person's. Well, I think the other person like backed into the car. You know? <laughs> Like the car was parked. I think that was the story. So it was parked and then boom, it came back. Oh. It was a minor accident. Like it just stopped and then nothing happened. It was just like minor bomb. But it's pretty a pretty good track record. So that's Google self driving car. It's already a reality. Uh, I mean, not mass production, but they're doing actively experimenting on it. Uh, the Google Glass part is basically a glass. It's sort of like a smartphone, but on a glass. There's going to be a small screen here, and you can see things here, and then you can I don't know read your email and Google things or something. And uh, it's already reality. How does it work? Um, so it's, there's a computer here, there's a battery here, and there's a screen here. And that's pretty much it. I mean, it's like a smartphone, right? I mean, like what is a smartphone really? It contains a battery, a screen, and a, and a computer, right? I asked, how do we navigate with those options? Oh, um, so it's basically you can touch, uh, touch it right here. And I believe they will have a a phone interface too, so you can control it via the phone too. But it's normally just touching here. And that's already a reality. And the cool thing is uh, that project was actually uh, a dream project, a research project of a professor at Georgia Tech. And he had been working on it uh, for a long time, like nearly 10 something years, 10 plus years. And uh, yeah, the Google guy said, um, let's make this a reality now. And the professor, he actually <coughs> took nearly two years off from Georgia Tech to go work on that project to make it happen. And now it's a reality. So everybody has an idea. So who 
is your idol and what influences you about it? Oh, um, with my idol, I haven't uh, really thought of it uh, that much. Uh, I mean, I like a lot of people. I mean, I like Mahatma Gandhi. I think it's pretty cool. Right? <laughs> 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 Similarly, Martin Luther King is pretty nice. Right? <laughs> um, but besides that, yeah, I haven't really thought of the whole idol thing. I think I, somebody's asked me this so a while. Field of profession. Do I feel profession? In my profession. No, I guess I like the owners, right? I think they did pretty cool work. <laughs> Good question, I should be thinking about that. I think it's time for the final part from you. Yeah, thanks for coming guys. I, I hope you guys have a wonderful academic career, undergraduate, masters and PhD. Uh, like I said, do something that you love doing, so you'll have fun and not be working. You'll be having fun, you'll be playing. Um, yeah.